That's good. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we got a couple more. Alex me is here. So, okay. Well, anyways, good afternoon, everyone. For those who are on, on view here, and welcome to our special guest, like uh, General Sims, uh, uh, Ms. Lynn Brickner, um, corporate executive. And I think we even have General Shinzeki. He may be on listening us, rating us, of course. And um, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. But uh, we're, we're, we're welcoming everybody. Uh, and as we noted on the program, this is about the standards of conduct for military and civilian professionals, albeit not, not too, you might say, publicly aware uh, that we do have standards of conduct in the government, especially for those uh, serving or have served in the executive branch of, of our government. But it also applies to our own set of principles about following the ethical and moral standards inclusive in law. And uh, I, we made available to you a copy of the principles of ethical conduct on this seminar, 14 principles of ethical conduct that President H.W. Bush enacted through executive um, order. I will assume some, some of you are, not, are aware of the Joint Ethics Regulation and Department of Defense Standards of Conduct. You could actually Google them on, on, on uh, online. Uh, generals and admirals and senior executive members of the federal government, political appointees or career employees are affected by this standards of conduct while appointed or executing their respective offices and they are accountable, but not just responsible, but held accountable to these standards. And for the most part, some of you have never heard of this legal requirement nor aware that violation of the standards of conduct could result in termination of your employment or prosecution for misconduct. And I know some of you or most of you have read some of these stories in the news of late. Now we are delighted to have Navy Lieutenant Simon Chun from the United States Navy Judge Advocate Corps. Uh, you have a copy of his bio. I hope you at least read, read his bio. But let me highlight a few of his outstanding accomplishments. Uh, he graduated from the George Washington University Law School in May of 2015 and was accepted in the United States Navy Judge Advocate Corps. Uh, he has extensive experience in leadership positions such as judge advocate in legal matters. They include operational law, appellate court, federal circuit, in military justice, legal assistance throughout the Navy, Army, Joint and Coalition Commands. Uh, he was born in Korea, Seoul, Korea, was raised in Manila, Philippines. I don't know how that happened but that you could ask them on the questions and answers series. But most impressive is that he is multilingual. He speaks Korean, French, Tagalog, which is a Filipino language, and of course, English. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lieutenant Simon Chan. Clap, 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 clap. And uh, all right, Simon, on you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like the general said, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Simon Chun. Um, you know, I'm currently on leave um, in, in New Jersey. So I, I heard someone uh, was uh, in uh, New York. Um, so not too far uh, from that neck of the woods over here. Um, I'll be returning and I'll be starting my new position um, tomorrow uh, on Monday, excuse me, um, as an aide de camp to um, our uh, the Navy's Judge Advocate General. Um, so a couple of things I want to highlight um, before we or disclaimers I want to put out before we continue on is that uh, one I'm not a currently certified ethics counselor so I, I am um, I am um, a licensed attorney under the Virginia State Bar um, I meet the uh, regular requirements for ethics uh, every year uh, with my state bar and with the Navy JAG Corps however from a DoD and Navy OGC perspective of someone who could give qualified ethics advice I am not currently practicing that um, on a regular basis. So I have some awareness. I'm familiar with the material that we'll go through today. Um, but uh, because I'm not an official ethics counselor, um, if you are someone who uh, falls under the category where you need to go through an annual training for ethics or standards of conduct, um, and that's usually for any kind of uh, general officer, flag officer, or SES uh, level person, um, if you have that annual requirement, this next the 45 minutes or so will not count towards your annual requirements. So I, I, I do apologize for that. Um, 
Um, I guess a little bit about me, um, as, as, as General said, I was born in Seoul, um, so I'm ethnically Korean. Uh, I grew up in the Philippines because my folks were missionaries in the Philippines. Uh, so my father was um, a uh, rock Navy chaplain um, in his uh, early 20s, and then after he uh, left um, the service and um, ministry in Korea, he became a missionary in the Philippines. So I grew up most of my first um, 18 years uh, in the Manila area, moved from Quezon to Pasig, um, and then lived most of it in Antipolo, actually. So I guess I'll say Mabuhay to uh, uh, you folks. And uh, I, I celebrated that first Olympic gold medal in weightlifting a couple of days ago, like it was like it was my own. So uh, it was a big deal. Um, I still am Filipino at heart uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so um, uh, I believe um, the slides will be pushed by Miss Peterson, um, and we'll just kind of go through, um, you know, just kind of, and I'll try to go through these as quickly as possible so we're not spending too much of a beautiful Saturday morning uh, stuck doing ethics here. All right, ma'am, if you want to go through, if you want to put that in presentation mode, I can just, uh, and I'll just go, I'll, I can say next slide before we move on. All right, uh, that'll work. Um, okay, so. Keep, so as the general alluded to earlier, um, one of the things we want to uh, keep in mind is that if you are active duty um, or a reservist who is subject to recall to active duty or a retiree draw, drawing pay, you are subject to the UCMJ, you are subject to the DOD standards of conduct, um, and you are um, subject to recall uh, for courts martial um, or um, any other kind of disciplinary hearings, uh, potentially. Um, so it's it's good to know that um, there are consequences. Uh, I think um, um, most recently at my job at the criminal law division, I uh, drafted uh, three uh, retiree recall requests uh, for them to be uh, court-martialed um, for the SECNAV signature. So it's not the most frequent thing in the world, uh, but it does happen, so keep that in mind. Um, and we'll kind of just go through this. This subject here, uh, the material that I had access to is very Navy oriented. So for those of our uh, other services, I apologize in advance, though I like to think that we are, are the best service. Um, I understand that I'm probably one of the few people at, uh, in this uh, Zoom today that feels that way. So we'll kind of push through some of, and these slides are also designed for uh, folks who are general officers, flag officers, and SESs. Um, but I, I edited them a little bit so that we have some of the more applicable things uh, in play here. I do believe that we have at least uh, at least a few uh, folks for whom uh, that title applies to. So honored to uh, you know be in the chat with you. Um, uh, you know, it's good that these slides are mostly designed for the uh, GOFOs and SES because that's kind of the highest level of conduct. So anything um, here, you know, is it should be the standard that we all aspire to uh, in a lot of ways. And then, um, of course, the subjects covered here are the most frequently uh, challenging areas uh, for when it comes to uh, standards of conduct, ethics, things along those lines. So we'll, we'll go ahead and push to slide two, ma'am. So uh, three general areas um, that we have in the agenda today, uh, think of them as um, people, places, um, and, and perks. Um, so uh, we, we'll kind of see um, use of staff members, uh, traveling and meeting with industry, although that's a minor issue. Um, maybe some folks here are in the industry. So it'd be good to know if you are part of the industry that meets with folks in the DOD that help help the DOD folks not get in trouble. Uh, that would be a, a good goal to have as well. Um, and then uh, traveling is also a big uh, issue um, and any kind of gifts. That's also a, a big um, uh, tripping point for a lot of folks. The general alluded to that you have the 14 government principles of ethical conduct uh, that uh, President H.W. Uh, Bush uh, signed into order. Um, 
And it's Executive Order 12674. Um, it's been published by the DOJ under the CFR, under Section 2635. The thing about those 14 principles, I'm not going to read them out loud, but they are very general statements. Um, uh, and uh, they have the operating word shall, uh, which kind of puts the onus on the employee. Um, and so um, each one has more specific rules under different CFRs, under different service regulations. But think of that as an operating rule set and aspirational goal. And then each at each level, you want to make sure that you are following the uh, intent, the written intent of those uh, principles at play. So some examples like employees shall not hold financial interests that conflict with the conscientious performance of duty. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll touch on something like that when it comes to conflict of interest um, later today. Um, and we'll um, go over to the next slide, please. So, uh, Leadership guidance, uh, Secretary Esper uh, back in 2019 uh, put out a couple of memos emphasizing these value-based decision-making um, in, in light of, um, is for example, in the Navy, we were very concerned with uh, GDMA, the Fat Leonard scandal that really, really rocked the service, um, particularly in the Pacific um, and has impacted how we do things service-wide. Um, and I think that obviously it, it, scandals like that uh, pile up to a certain degree. And back in 2017, um, um, there was a real push starting then to really revamp our ethics and standards of conduct um, and how we do things. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have to uh, say that, um, you know, the previous uh, leadership at the DOD did their best to kind of push this agenda out. Um, and I encourage everyone to check out those memos. I'm not going to go into them in depth here. Um, and um, obviously, there's also uh, Secretary uh, Mattis's um, the ethical midfield. Um, and he had a memo called uh, Ethical Standards for All Hands uh, that back in 2017 as well. So um, all of those things will be um, uh, relevant material. Um, and then since then, we have been uh, implementing this uh, annual requirement that by November 30th, everyone, um, every uh, general officer, flag officer, SES, um, should be um, doing an annual ethics training. So that's, the, but unfortunately, this requirement does not count towards that. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So staff support, working with aides, um, you know, when it comes to um, GOFOs, SES, um, these aides, uh, both the flag aides, the officers, um, and the enlisted aides um, are really there um, to make sure that um, the executive, the general, the admiral is functioning um, to the best of their abilities and that they're not getting in any kind of trouble. Um, and same goes for, so you'll have folks like you know myself um, or flag riders, et cetera, um, who are trying to do their job um, but and they represent people, the you know that executive's people, um, and the aid itself doesn't only refer to the people that wear the rope. It wears it refers to all the people that work under that uh, officer's um, office, um, if you will. So that includes personal staff, executive assistants, civilians, even um, pro protocol officers. Um, so all those folks are there um, to ensure um, that that. Um, general officer or flag officer's office uh, is uh, functioning properly. Uh, I highlighted these two folks uh, because the, the staff support that comes from them and then working through them is very important. Um, so if you're meeting with a, um, if you've got a meeting with a GOFO or an SES um, and you want to make sure that no side is getting in trouble, make sure that you are communicating with the respective staff members um, because, you know, that saves everyone's ass, right? Uh, next slide, please. Um, th this highlights some of the things that um, general officers, uh, flag officers, um, um, aides can do and shouldn't do. Um, so just kind of some of the X's and O's. Um, 
flag aides. Um, so someone like myself starting on Monday may perform some personal services for the flag officers, uh, but you know they must be rare, they must be uh, minor, and they must be truly voluntary. It can't be that, um, um, so I can't be ordered by the JAG uh, to go get him a cup of coffee. I can say, Sir, I'm going to go run down and grab a cup of coffee. Would you like to grab me one? So, so these are the lines that uh, you, you need to kind of think about. Um, and the thing here is that everyone is in the service to the government. And as long as whatever they're doing is making your function um, as that government employee, um, if it continues to expand on that function um, and helps you do that function well, that those are typically permissible uses um, of your staff member. Impermissible uses, as you can see, um, you'll see that you know providing pet or child care. And, you know, I'm not there to be a babysitter or a pet sitter, um, for example. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, uh, here, I, I like the note here: uh, flag aides, and this includes all staff members of a uh, flag officer or general officer, are is assigned to enable those GOFOs to perform their official duties more effectively. An aide may perform duties on behalf of said officer um, that would otherwise be uh, that that officer would otherwise be required to perform in the execution of his or her official duties. Um, so that's something to uh, just kind of keep in mind. Things uh, things can get a little tricky when uh, there's temporary duty uh, TDY um, outside of your general location. Uh, that's when you want to uh, make sure that every step of the agenda is relatively cleared um, and um, it helps to talk through things uh, with uh, an ethics counselor before going on a trip. Um, some of well, I'll just kind of leave it at that. If we have any questions, I'll, I'm happy to touch on them um, as we uh, towards the end as well. Next slide, please. So this this, this applies for our enlisted aides. Um, so um, the are you know typically flag riders um, in the Navy. We have YNs um, and sometimes uh, OSs um, who work in um, a uh, a um, flag staff like this. Um, and they're authorized for the purpose of uh, relieving uh, GOFOs uh, of the minor tasks, um, you know, that would be at the expense of their official duties. Uh, so things like uh, planning and preparing events, um, helping the other uh, flag aides um, in the office, um, and they are uh, they're permitted to assist in PCS moves. Um, now, uh, it's a it's a tricky thing, so it's got to make sure that any any kind of um, quote unquote minor like lab laborious tasks like that have to be officially related to their government duty. So making making sure that that line doesn't get crossed uh, over uh, is uh, something to keep in mind when talking about enlisted uh, aides on flag staffs. Uh, next slide, please. Travel. So this, uh, we're going to hit on a couple of different points here uh, as we talk about travel. Um, and if you are involved in official government travel, that's not necessarily uh, DOD related. Uh, a lot of these principles still come into play because they come from um, uh, the JTR, uh, which also is derived from federal laws in general. Um, so some of those references here, um, if you have specific questions um, as to, hey, can you can give me the source of that specific JTR or something like that, please let me know. Um, I'm happy to uh, provide that um, as well. Um, so something that the VCNO uh, has put out, at least on the Navy side, is that no area of standards of conduct is more closely scrutinized and complex than travel. Um, Official travel plans, uh, they're typically required to be reviewed by an ethics counselor um, before, before they begin. So especially if it involves more than a day or two, um, you want to get that clear. You want to have every part of your schedule mapped out. You want to know where you're going, what time you'll be there, what mode of transportation you'll be using, what you'll be eating, um, and how you'll be paying for those things. Uh, that's, a, that's a clear path that you want to make sure that you have. 
Um, so you want to make you, you want to clear things with your ethics counselor, uh, your itinerary, flight, hotel accommodations, uh, gov or car rental plans in and around the TAD area. Uh, you know, it, it helps that if you did a little research or your staff did a little research on, okay, you know, sir, ma'am, we'll eat here that evening. Um, you know, when we first check in, things like that are all good to clear out as well. Uh, there are some references when it comes to commercial air. Um, obviously, the uh, the default is to travel coach or economy. However, um, using getting personal bonus, uh, not bonus, but personal miles, um, you know, that you accumulate um, or any kind of status that you have with an airline from travel and any kind of uh, upgrade that kind of comes from that, uh, that's permissible. That's okay. Um, uh, however, there may be certain circumstances that you need to ask ethical um, ethics related questions of, for example, that, hey, uh, why did they upgrade you? Did they upgrade you because you were traveling in your service uniform um, and, you know, they, they just kind of threw that to you? Um, that If that was the case, that's potentially an ethics question that you may even have to compensate for by paying back some miles or a fee or something like that. Um, you know, if did they try, did they do that because you have, I don't, you were Delta Diamond because of all your years of flying back and forth. You know that that's a natural upgrade that you personally are entitled to. So make sure that you're distinguishing between uh, between those things. Um, so you know, think about like was the upgrade random? Things along those lines. Um, there are circumstances in which business class and first class travel, um, you know, uh, can happen. Um, and, and within those things, there are certain rules as well. Um, for example, if business class is offered uh, to you naturally as a from a permissible use um, or um, certain times when there are no other seats other than business class seats and the travel is urgent, you are allowed to purchase a business class ticket. Same goes for even like a first class uh, type of scenario. If like the economy and coach is full, but like there's a first class seat available, I guess you have to pay for that and you can get compensated for that, but you'd have to show that um, as well. So um, lots of complicating things when it comes to um, um, class of travel on the air. Um, but that operating thing I want to take about um, this, um, this thing is that uh, travel is the red herring um, of, of ethics and standards of contact regulation. Best practice is to make sure that you've itemized everything, you have receipts for every part of your itinerary, um, so that there are no questions on the back end. Next slide, please. Uh, military air, um, so required users of uh, of military air for all travel, official and unofficial, SecDef, Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff. So this is, we're talking about the, the private um, Gulfstream, um, you know, and then tier two, um, all the uh, Chiefs of Service, uh, military services, combatant commanders uh, for official travel, they have access to that Gulfstream. Uh, one of my good friends um, uh, in the JAG Corps is currently the CNO's aide, um, um, the, currently the CNO's flag aide, and um, I met up with her for coffee a couple of weeks ago, and um, um, she she was joking that um, she's been traveling um, on a Gulfstream uh, regularly for the last uh, eight months or so, uh, which is an amazing perk of the job, even as she's working throughout uh, whatever flight. Uh, but then she said, yeah, but the downside is I don't get any miles for those, to which I said, I'm crying many tears for you. I am so sad for you. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, so obviously these are some of the limitations for that. Um, and then for the Navy side, at least you have uh, Fleet Forces Command, PAC Fleet, Navior, uh, some of the vice chiefs of other military services, uh, deputy commanders, um, and then uh, the PAC fleet, Navior, kind of equivalent on the in the Army and Air Force side, uh, they are also permitted on the military air uh, for official travel um, if there are circumstances that um, that present itself for that. Um, so just kind of just reading in the box there, are there other official travel individuals outside of these four tiers? Uh, they may be able to use the military air Gulfstream um, when neither commercial air nor airlift service um, are reasonably available, uh, which is a very rare circumstance. Um, there are highly unusual circumstances presented at clearing present danger. So that's like when terror threat or something like that is higher and you need to evacuate some folks or something along those lines. And um, there may be circumstances where a mill air is more cost effective than a comm air or a charter flight. Um, we'll talk about certain scenarios where like, for example, a mill air is already going to someplace 
Um, and a person who kind of falls outside of tier one through four um, has an official duty related to that location, you may be able to hitch a ride. Um, so that, that might be a possibility. Um, maybe some of our uh, general officers have stories, something along those lines. Uh, but um, you know, that's, that's something that's possible. We'll, we'll, we'll see uh, some of those exceptions uh, moving through that as well. Uh, something to keep in mind here is for all requests that kind of fall outside of these official tiers, uh, you got to make sure that um, everything is documented um, a, as much as possible. And then um, everything must then be approved by the senior traveler um, on, on, on that flight um, uh, or the person who would be um, in charge of approving said travel. Um, next question. Uh, next slide, please. Excuse me. So, uh, slide. Uh, okay, so this is this is one of the first scenarios. Um, so, can my spouse travel with me? It's scenario one. You have been sent on official visit to Yokosuka to represent Compact Fleet um, at a conference. Miller has been approved. Your spouse wants to do some holiday shopping in Tokyo, and there are seats available on the plane. Can your spouse travel with you? And do you have to reimburse the U.S. government for the trip? So because we're on a Zoom call here, I'm not going to say, you know, you know, someone raise your hand, but mentally um, or even out loud to yourself, um, you know, say, what do you think? Is the answer to question one, yes or no? Um, is the answer to number two, yes or no? I'll give you a couple seconds. So this one relates to travel by spouse on Mill Air for a personal, non-official reason. Next slide, please. So as a general rule, uh, spouse, family, guest travel, it, uh, they're not funded. Uh, they, if they are accompanying on um, official business on a government aircraft, unofficial travelers must reimburse full coach fare. Now, um, the, the, the scenario here, if you remember, was there was a, there were seats available on that flight. That flight was already going, right? Uh, that means that if your spouse wants to accompany you, she can or he can uh, have a seat if they pay for what would be a equivalent coach fare of that flight. So if compact fleet, so this was probably a flight from uh, Hawaii to uh, yeah, uh, Tokyo um, or Hawaii to uh, Yokohama or something along those lines, whatever coach flight uh, is, you know, would be for that. If you reimburse that to the government, you could have a seat. So it probably is a good deal considering, you know, you'd be flying on a uh, mill air flight, uh, um, most likely a Gulfstream flight there. So, so that's a possibility. Um, hope that makes sense. Next slide, please. Another scenario. Scenario two, can my spouse travel me? Scenario two, you are the Midland region commander. Um, right now, I believe that's a two star. Uh, and you are visiting Naval Submarine Base New London. So you're going from Norfolk to uh, Groton, Connecticut, or Connecticut area. Um, again, sorry that all these samples are Navy related um, or Navy specific. It's just what I had access to. Um, Mill Air has been approved as part of your visit. Your spouse is set to host a talk with the spouses of recent pipeline graduates of the submarine deployments on dependence. There are seats available on the plane. One, can your spouse travel with you? Two, do you have to reimburse the US government for the trip? So this is a little different because it's still Mill Air. However, um, your spouse is going up there for a DOD. Uh, in, DOD has a, sp a special interest in your spouse going up there because it's a part particular concern for military uh, families. So while not mission essential, this would be considered something that is being done for the benefit of the Department of Defense. So one, can your spouse travel with you? Two, does he or she have to reimburse the US government for the trip? Next slide. So because uh, the sp uh, this spouse in this circumstance uh, and their presence had a DOD interest, non-reimbursable travel is probably authorized for this uh, specific thing. So it's an exception for non-reimbursable spouse travel. And when the spouse's presence is in their interest, it's authorized, you're good to go, and must be no additional cost to the government. So as long as they're doing something that is specifically related to um, uh, the military in some way, um, and there are seats available, they're good to go. Next slide, please. Can my spouse travel with me? Scenario three. Um, so this, 
another region commander, you're approved to travel and attend in your official capacity, three-day conference hosted by the Spanish foreign minister for US and EU dignitary and military leaders. On day two of the official schedule of events, there is a high tea uh, scheduled for the spouses only. You are traveling by com air, so commercial air. Can your spouse travel with you? Does your spouse have to pay for the trip? If not, is your spouse authorized per diem? So something to keep in mind here is that is that this is on commercial travel, but it's for an event related to the official representational duties at a diplomatic event. So one, two, three, what do you say? Per diem is a new kicker here. Next slide, please. So this is a very new rule change, very, very new in that um, starting last August, for any other uh, individual, including spouse, travel must be pre-approved by an authorizing official and meet the requirements of uh, 5 USC section 5703 to be legitimately performing a direct service for the government. Uh, so uh, under the scenario that we're talking about here, uh, we could probably uh, get to yes. Um, and that, that's obviously something that um, I, I I've only been in six years, but I know enough commanders uh, who have told me, get me to yes on uh, multiple issues um, as JAG. Um, and uh, you could probably get to yes on the high T being an official function uh, for, the, uh, for the spouse to be able to travel with them. Um, and also be, um, and also probably be authorized some sort of per diem, at least for the day that he or she is doing that official duty. Um, but you just gotta make sure that starting uh, starting last October, all of that has to be pre-approved. It can't be something that um, just easy, easily jump on uh, like in the previous uh, time period. So again, um, if we work through the scenario, most likely they would be approved to travel. Uh, they would be uh, given per diem, uh, at least for the day uh, that, that they are doing that official duty. Um, but uh, you have to get this uh, pre-approved. Uh, because this rule change is so recent, though, um, a lot of the applicability of this is still being worked through. Um, I, when I got this slide set um, from, from our um, ethics and standards of conduct branch uh, within the uh, Office of the Judge Advocate, uh, they were saying, hey, this slide specifically, uh, tell them we are working through this and all the services are still working through how exactly this would apply. Um, so keep that, I guess, in mind. This is, an, uh, this is a work in progress. Um, and anything that is still under a year old um, you know, will have those effects. So uh, next slide, please. All right, travel on government vehicles. Um, I think folks are pretty familiar with this when you're using govies, right? Uh, what you, where, where you can go, what can you do? Um, you know, uh, you, you hear uh, about, oh, what kind of uniform are you allowed to be in in a govy? And, um, you know, on your, how many miles can you deviate away all, you know, there are uh, specific rules um, and there are certain uh, sections that apply to that, your uh, US codes, there are uh, CFRs um, that speak to these specifically, but generally speaking, permissible uses, official business, official speaking events, um, you can use it while on TAD uh, and you could use it to run those errands while you're uh, run errands that are, um, going to places like dry cleaners and barbers, um, drug stores, the essentials while on TAD, you could use a govy for. Um, impermissible uses while on TAD, you can't use it to go to a movie theater. You can't use it to, um, you know, continue on leave or something like that, um, you know, a, as your official duties end and going into the weekend. Um, so generally speaking, these are the kind of things that the two things fall into. And then there may be, uh, based on a, what type of vehicle you have, um, certain other regulations that go on top of that. These days, a lot of bases, um, I know my last base, uh, my last duty station uh, in Naval Station Everett um, had uh, an electric vehicle uh, that was a govy as well. Um, so there were certain, not limit extra limitations per se, uh, but there were certain um, things that folks who were using those cars had to keep in mind, right? They needed to know, okay, the charging station is going to be at this place. So you can only go from there to there. And that's probably going to be a, um, a, you know, a more and more frequent thing uh, that we see uh, when it comes to using government vehicles. Um, all right, next slide, please. Can my spouse travel with me? Scenario four. 
You're the commander of a subgroup and you're attending a conference which is being held at a hotel on Guam. Um, uh, side story about Guam. Uh, so my uh, quick quick sidebar, if you'll allow me. Uh, as I When I was growing up in the Philippines, my grandparents were already immigrated to the US. So they sponsored green cards for my dad, uh, my mom, and, and uh, well, and eventually to us as well. But in order to maintain our US green card, we needed to touch US soil every six months while we were growing up. Uh, there were times where we could obviously not afford uh, to touch US soil every six months. Um, so every time it would be Guam that we would try to uh, fly into. And there was one weekend I remember where we, uh, my parents literally saved uh, every dime that they could for um, months so that we could get on that flight to Guam to stay and days in for one night and as a family. Um, and, um, and so Guam, I have been to, I wanna say almost a dozen times, uh, but only once or twice that I actually get to tour the beautiful island. Uh, so personal side story. Um, so the uh, hotel is in Guam, your spouse and three children came with you as you intend to take follow on leave in Guam. So this is a potential tricky scenario there. Uh, your family wants to go to the beach and sightsee in Tumon Bay um, while you are in the day's meetings. One, can your family ride in the vehicle with you? Two, if your family plus your aid won't fit in the sedan that you are entitled to for your TAD, can you obtain a larger vehicle on your travel order to accommodate your family? So basically, can your family ride with you in the govy while you are performing official duties? Next slide. All right, so on a space available basis, yes, they can come with you. Um, however, they can't take the car then on their own to go to the beach while you are speaking at a conference or something like that. Um, also, um, if the aide can't fit in the car uh, you know, with your family, your family is gonna have to get a second car. Uh, that, will, uh, that will have to be the case. Um, and um, so uh, uh, something uh, to keep in mind here, no additional cost to the government and no larger uh, than required for the official basis. So this is a little tricky thing that I've seen um, a lot of times. So I've actually seen this happen where uh, you got a free upgrade because a free upgrade was available at the rent, uh, you know, um, or, or a bigger car was available. Um, so let's say the official duty only required a sedan, but it's like, hey, but we have the van, um, you know, if you if you want to take the van instead, and there's no additional cost involved, you can do that. Um, so and, and a rental car uh, agency, if, if, as, if there is no uh, additional cost for the larger car upgrade, or let's say you have status with something like Hertz or something like that, and it gets you a free upgrade anyway, that's usually good to go. Yeah, that, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, next slide, please. Gifts. So if we said travel was the trickiest and most uh, thorny side of uh, you know standards of conduct and ethics in the government, gifts is a close number two. So general rule for gifts from outside sources, employees shall not solicit or accept directly or indirectly a gift from a prohibited source or given because of the employee's official position. Basically don't take bribes, don't ask for bribes and don't, you know, don't take things that you are like, this sounds fishy or iffy, don't do it. Prohibited sources, does that person or entity uh, do or seek to do business with the DOD or have interests that may be substantially affected by the employee's official duties. If yes to anything of the above, that's a prohibited source. Uh, official position test. This is a question that, you know, we throw to ask, you know, kind of a, um, you know, think about this as the long, would the gift and gift the had not held the status, authority, or duties associated with the federal position. Would I be getting this gift if I wasn't an officer in the military? Would I be getting this gift if I wasn't an SES, um, you know, in whatever department? Think about that uh, when it comes to that, uh, when, um, when you're thinking about it. And then this is obviously a little bit more tricky these days. Gifts to spouses, dependent children, and chosen charities are imputed to the service member, as in they are, um, um, they are, um, designed for them. Uh, so as in anything, any gifts that are um, sent to spouses and children, they will be counted towards um, the service member. All right, moving along to our next slide. We'll try to go through gifts relatively quickly here. Um, is the item actually a gift? Does an exception apply? Shall I accept this gift? Even if an exclusion exception applies, appearance is always a factor. 
Um, so, and we'll touch on that a little bit. So, you know, when you are, it's like, okay, I, it turns out I am allowed to accept this gift just because you are allowed to doesn't mean you should. So we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. Next slide, please. So is the item actually a gift? Coffee, tea at an event is not a gift. Anything paid by the government is not a gift. Um, plaques that you receive for, you know, coming to speak at an event, not considered a gift. Um, little, you know, uh, so certain cultures obviously have like little intrinsic uh, trinkets or things like that, souvenirs that they give out uh, for, for coming, or something like that. That's typically not a gift if, as long as it's below a certain number. Um, items uh, accepted on behalf of your service, branch of service, uh, not a gift, and prizes won in contests are not a gift. Um, and any kind of, um, oh, we'll touch on that in the next slide, actually. So uh, next slide, please. Does an exception apply? Anything $20 or less, not to exceed $50 a year, that's, that's uh, an exception applies. There are certain discounts and similar benefits. Um, you know, it doesn't apply to, uh, for example, is, is it a discount that all military members can get? That, then that is not a gift. Um, is it a widely attended gathering, um, free attendance, um, you know, let's say for all service members or something like that, or uh, attendance is free for the first 100 service members or something along those lines, you know, that's typically an exception uh, that you can, um, you can do. Something to keep in mind here, though, is that if a gift is over $20, you cannot pay down the difference. So let's say you receive a gift that is $60 worth, you know, in fair market value. You can't say, oh, here's $40 and then I'll accept the rest because it's under $20. That is not something that is permitted. Uh, so uh, please be aware of that. Um, and then it, keep in mind, it, not to exceed $50. Uh, so like if it's a meal or something like that, maybe one time lunch, um, you know, as long as it's not from a prohibited source, uh, you might be okay, um, but keep that in mind when receiving uh, those kind of gifts. And, inter and if you are on the business side, when you're interacting with folks on the military. Uh, next slide, please. Foreign gifts exceptions. Um, so this number creeps up every year. Right now it stands at around $415 um, or less. Uh, so a foreign government, you can receive a gift up until that amount. If it is larger than that, you may be able to accept it on behalf of your branch of service or the United States government, but special rules apply. There's a slide that touches on that um, as well. Um, but you know, and this is the catch-all here. Always contact your ethics counselor, or if you don't have an ethics counselor personally attached to you, your office definitely does. Uh, your office will have a line to the SOCO office, uh, DOD SOCO office, or the OGC's office that has a contact at the SOCO office. SOCO obviously being the standards of contact, uh, standards of conduct office. Um, so always ask. Uh, uh, that's always good, um, and um, that's typically kind of the way I would I would suggest we go. All right, next slide, please. Should I accept the gift? Does the gift have high value? Does the donor have interest that you may substantially affect your duties, right? So like if you accept this gift, is there an implication that goes outside of the monetary value? It's like, oh yeah, now I'm gonna do you favors for doing this, uh, for receive, receiving this gift. Uh, we remember what we talked about a couple of slides ago, appearance matters. Um, now there is a risk of declining a gift uh, that could embarrass a person who is giving the gift, right? So that's a concern, and you don't want the uh, you don't want um, the Navy or some other service kind of um, looking like they're slapping the person, um, saying no thank you, or being looking ungrateful. Um, so weigh that risk, if you will, um, you know, uh, some sort of like. Um, um, firm statement when you decline a gift. It's like, hey, you know, sorry, we're just not allowed to. We are really honored by the thought, uh, but we're just on the mission, really uh, have private gain. A statement like that that you work through might be a good thing to kind of have in your back pocket uh, when you weigh those uh, different interests in play. Next slide, please. Gifts between employees. Um, basic thing to keep in mind here is that as long as there isn't a superior subordinate uh, relationship, um, you know, some minimal gifts um, and uh, special occasion gifts where people are, you know, soliciting, hey, someone is going, a CEO is retiring, um, $10 donations, completely voluntary. A call like that is okay, um, as long as it's totally voluntary and non-coercive. Um, 
However, even gifts like that typically have a limit of three hundred dollars um, from from your uh, you know for example your command your uh, your uh, the, your service members that work for you um, saying goodbye to a, a commanding officer um, that has certain limits as well. Um, unsolicited gifts may be given on traditional gift giving occasions, things like you know hey uh, you can have a uh, Christmas white elephant kind of thing within the office, right? Or secret Santa within the office or something like that. That's okay, um, as long as um, gift is worth uh, $10 or less and it can't be cash. Um, some people have tried to get away with it by saying gift cards, and that's kind of right on the gray line. Um, uh, typically, I, I, I haven't seen a ton of ethics counselors say, no, you can't do gift cards to like Subway or something like that. Next slide, please. Proper disposition, getting rid of gifts. Um, uh, so we talked about line one earlier, diplomatically refusing the gift or, or returning the gift to the donor. You could accept it there and then return it later. And as long as you documented that you accepted and returned it, uh, that's that's considered a, a proper disposition. Uh, pay fair market value. Uh, you can't, again, this is another one of those things. You, can, uh, you cannot pay down a gift to fit within the gift exception. So let's say you received the $2,000 or something. You can't say, I'm going to pay $1,500 and $1,585 back so that I can keep this uh, under that exception. That is uh, not allowed. Um, and again, you can accept something that exceeds the $415, however, uh, on behalf of the US, uh, but there are certain rules that apply there. Next slide, please. So this is that slide. Um, acceptance on behalf of the Navy or any kind of uh, the US government, uh, $200,000 or less, the CNO, VCNO, uh, and the Director of National Security can, um, can um, accept that. And then obviously there are certain tiers that uh, come below that. And I think these numbers are equivalent through the other services as well. Um, uh, so, um, you know, the chief of staff of the army can accept $200,000 or less. Um, same goes for the Air Force, et cetera. Uh, we'll see about the Space Force and what uh, what regulations that they'll be subject to, but I presume they will be the same. Because uh, my, um, I think everything from what I am seeing is that they're being built just like the Marine Corps is within the Navy, Space Force is within the Air Force. But thankfully, they're using proper uh, naval ranks, um, at least at the moment. So it'd be weird to have a colonel in space. Next slide, please. Uh, interactions with industry. Um, I know some folks here may be in industry and you interact with uh, folks uh, who are on the DOD side or you know, kind of you know, uh, maybe crossed over uh, from uh, DOD to or one of the other branches into industry where you're interacting with folks in the government. Um, so, you know, folks, on, it's kind of a reality now that's set on that, um, hey folks, uh, high ranking officials uh, within the service may have to meet with folks um, in, um, in industry and in business. Um, so you are allowed to meet with suppliers of particular product types. Um, you are um, you know, allowed to even like kind of represent the Navy um, or whatever service to do that. However, um, what you're not allowed to do is meet only with a single supplier um, when there are three or four other suppliers uh, of equivalent capability. So you can't show favoritism. You can't allow a monopoly or anything like that. Um, and uh, another thing is you can't only meet with the people who currently have a contract or who provides that good. You have to be, uh, you have to kind of open that up um, and you can't show favoritism to anyone just because they currently have that contract. All right. Uh, another thing to keep in mind when meeting with folks uh, outside of the DOD, um, um, you know, for or, or in industry, uh, careful not to disclose non-public information. You can't advise a contractor to get to so that they can have a good, better com uh, competitive bid. You can't say, oh, you know, you know, it would be best if you're if someone's uh, next bid say they can provide X number, um, because I think if someone said X number, that would be good. Um, you can't have that. And we got to always be careful of appearances. Next slide, please. Um, endorsements. Um, you all, it, this is a this is a tr tricky thing. Um, obviously, there are certain things like the CFC Combined Federal Campaign or the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society or other equivalent types of uh, charity organizations that are directly linked with the services um, that are always okay to get uh, an endorsement. Um, but this is um, typically uh, official endorsements of non-federal entities are prohibited. Um, and then we talk about some of those ex uh, exceptions. Um, 
and you don't want to portray items like um, uh, you don't want to give prefer preferential treatment. You don't want to improperly coerce other DOD personnel. You don't want to be getting the message out there that, hey, soldiers, sailors, airmen only use this type of product or, you know, we we support this entity. Um, you know, uh, that's that's not a great look. Moving along. Next slide, please. Conflicts of interest. These are the four major sections uh, that talk about uh, conflicts of interest in the US code. Do not accept bribes. That seems like a no brainer. Do not represent or accept money for representing another's interests before the US government. Do not uh, take official action that will affect your personal finance, uh, financial interests for those of your spouse, children, and prospective employment. Do not accept payment for, or from another for the performance of your federal duties. Um, so, for example, in theory, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm currently still in active duty. I'm performing a somewhat legal comp uh, capacity by, uh, you know, by doing this uh, slideshow and training. Um, I would not be allowed to receive money for this. Oh, not that I'm asking for, not that I'm asking Palm for any money, but uh, that. That's certainly strictly prohibited uh, un under uh, under this. Um, we'll talk about uh, one matter that kind of comes up much more frequently now, um, and that's a uh, personal financial interests or those of your spouse. So that's something that we may uh, be uh, looking into. Um, a recent example, for example, is that if, as a, as you know, we had that Jedi contract with the DoD and Microsoft. Um, so that's a potential, um, and obviously that's been in the news again because they decided, hey, you know, it turns out this may not have been great. Um, at the time, Secretary Esper recused himself uh, from, from that decision uh, making because he had an adult son who was uh, employed by Microsoft at the time. So something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, slide 30. Next slide, please. Distinguishing between conflicts of interest and partiality, who's a regular employee, someone who's obviously on active duty or a reserve person who was voluntarily uh, received orders uh, that, that put them on active duty for more than half the year. Um, and then special government employees are uh, any reservist who works uh, their regular kind of reserve duties. Um, who's on active duty solely for training, reservists who's voluntarily recalled to active duty, uh, involuntarily, excuse me. Uh, so those are the two kind of two specific categories um, when it comes to uh, distinguishing folks for conflict of interest. Next slide, please. So kind of looking at these two um, representational service restrictions, cannot act as an attorney or agent, receive compensation derived from representational service. So this is kind of what I touched on earlier, right? I can't, um, I'm not representing the JAG Corps uh, currently uh, in, this, in, in, in this hour per se, uh, but I'm certainly doing a JAG Corps related function um, and I can't be compensated for this. Um, and um, a special government employee would be uh, subject to um, same restrictions um, when it comes to uh, if it's related to their job um, within the uh, military or the government. Next slide, please. Other conflicts of interest considerations, um, official acts uh, prohibits participating personally and substantially in any particular way in which the employee has a financial interest. So um, this is uh, something to keep in mind when it comes to um, um, excuse me, uh, like doing another job, um, moonlighting, um, uh, certain things are allowed, other things are not. Um, um, you can, uh, if you if you really like, be a uh, paid tutor, for example, on the weekends, uh, which I have done in uh, at a previous duty station, um, or where I once a week still taught SAT uh, classes, for example. Uh, you know, um, that's okay. What I can't do is uh, suddenly go once a week and become a, a contractor, a part-time contractor for a defense agency or something like that. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and um, this is where I want to touch on briefly on spouse employment. Um, I had to disclose when my spouse accepted, my spouse works for Microsoft, uh, but I had to disclose what branch she works on, what project she works on, so that we make sure that that's not um, anything that kind of um, has any kind of matters um, or any com uh, conflict matters. Um, any any bonus or money that she receives, even if we file our taxes separately, from an ethical standpoint and a standard of conduct standpoint, can still be imputed to me. Uh, so I need to make sure that I'm not involved with any kind of 
decision making when it comes to her uh, products that she may be working on. Um, so that's something to keep in mind uh, because as you know, more and more folks are in dual working uh, households. Um, um, and um, if your uh, spouse's uh, employer has any kind of business with the US government, always be on the safe side and disclose those things. Um, I, when I disclose my things to uh, our ethics department, they laugh and they're like, haha, Simon, uh, don't think that you're, we don't think that you're that important, but um, <laughs> it, it's uh, something to uh, still uh, check the box off, uh, better be safe than sorry. Next slide, please. Uh, public financial uh, disclosures, uh, this certainly matters to folks who are higher ranking um, as a flag officer as SES, reserve flag officers, these are some of those requirements. I'm not an expert on these things and 278Ts, annual reports, things along those lines. So if you have questions on these matters, I am not your guy, uh, but if you want to ask me them and I can do, I'll do my best to refer them to someone who may know better. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, reserve component, I think I, I think there are some folks who are still under reserves here who may be subject to uh, another set of orders, things along those lines. You have the, the onus is on the reserve member themselves to disclose that, hey, I can't go do that job because during the day or during full time, I have this job, uh, which may present a conflict of interest because the detailers are not going to know every day what you do, what projects you work on. So the onus is on the reserve uh, reservists themselves to make sure they disclose those things. Um, and then there are obviously certain limitations on sitting on board of directors. Um, if you're a reserve uh, flag officer or a general officer, um, and you are still serving uh, close to half the year on any kind of active duty uh, thing, and so this would apply to folks like National Guard or something like that, um, you can't sit on boards of certain companies. Um, so that's also something to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, so and, and touched on. Um, basically that the reservists have, have an independent duty to screen themselves to avoid conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. Post-government employment. Uh, this is tricky. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is what is considered seeking employment and what is considered not seeking employment. If you're directly soliciting, directly making contact, um, other than to respond to a rejection, uh, re respond to a proposal and rejecting it, um, you're in a seeking employment category. In which case, there are certain rules that apply to you. You can't be, uh, you can't go directly jump to work for a company in which you had a particular matter, um, or a, uh, or you going over there could have a direct and predictable effect. Now, those are. Um, official terms um, saying that I worked on, let's suppose on the Air Force side, I worked on uh, making sure, reviewing certain contracts for certain aircraft for the Air Force. Uh, if you then uh, are considered seeking employment with say Boeing or something like that, um, and you jumping over to Boeing will have a direct and predictable effect to contracts with the Air Force or something along those lines. That is not a that is a restricted type of um, uh, contact, and there could be consequences uh, that follow from that. Um, uh, if you have specific questions about these, I recommend reading through some of the CFRs that are directly related to this, um, so that you can distinguish between what is considered seeking employment and what is considered not. Uh, we have a cup. Next slide, please. So these are some of the timelines. Uh, you have the cooling off period, six months for all officers, regardless of a general officer, or flag officer or not. You get the one year cooling off period for flag officers and general officers, a two year ban from certain things uh, for all officers. You may not communicate or appear to int uh, with intent to influence before the US government on behalf of any other than uh, the US government. So this is you know, basically you know, lobbying uh, for another country or something like that along those lines. You have a lifetime ban from certain things. Um, so uh, this is for uh, in connection with any matter in which you participate personally and substantially while a government employee. So that could be a very specific thing. Uh, like I talked about earlier with that Air Force, con uh, Air Force officer who was reviewing plane contracts. You're not allowed to be doing that line of work, for example, after you get out. 
And then lobbying bans, you'll see one years or two years, um, no lobbying activities or behind the scenes work with respect to DOD matters. We've recently had um, um, certain uh, retired officers who kind of maybe didn't follow that uh, restriction. We're in the home stretch here. Uh, this is just a plug for our JAG uh, core, uh, not just the Navy, but your other services as well. If you if you have a line to a JAG, um, uh, you're an SJA or an ethics counselor, please uh, call them. It, um, you know, it's that's what they're there for. Um, and um, I've never known a JAG to say, oh, uh, that that's annoys me, even if they don't know the answer, an ethics question or a standards of conduct question, they will uh, move many things in their calendar or um, or you know in their world to try to get you an answer within a reasonable time period because we know that's one of our main functions. Next slide, please. Um, uh, I think next slide is lessons learned, unless I skip the slide. Uh, the slide 38, um, lessons learned page there. So, Take care of the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves. That's a quote um, that, you know, you know, take care of the little things, right? And then uh, and the other things will follow. Um, and you build a good habit of checking in with your ethics counselors. Um, that's the way you want to build things. Um, I touched on some of the, at least on the Navy side, some of our failures uh, in recent years um, with GDMA and some of those scandals um, uh, uh, in the Pacific. Um, when reviewing that, a lot of it came out to be that um, other uh, commanders or staff officers basically received the proper uh, legal advice and then directly went against it. Or um, legal advice was inaccurate. Um, and obviously that's on that's on the fault. That's the JAG's fault in that circumstance. But uh, a very popular category was JAG just didn't know uh, that something was going on uh, because they were never in the loop. Um, and that was the most, uh, that's the most heartbreaking thing because a lot of that could have been prevented. Um, you know, the folks' careers have been ruined. You have senior officers sitting in brigs right now uh, from these scandals. So um, what you want to make sure is that you are um, doing all the little things, taking care of all the little things. Um, and, um, you know, if you're a high ranking officer, uh, you know, you know what never hurts. Um, I encourage all, all folks to ask, did JAG see this? Um, and uh, yeah, that's you know, put the onus on us as much as possible, um, and, uh, because that will save everyone. Uh, they will save everyone at the end. Um, and really, the next slide is just a, a list of all the other resources that we touched on. Um, General touched on SOCO, OGE, obviously, as well. Um, and uh, the standards of conduct uh, guide um, is also on the uh, SOCO page as well. Um, and, and really, that's it. Like I said, I'm not an ethics counselor right now, but I'm about to walk into a job where I'll be dealing with this on a regular basis. Um, and if you have any questions now, um, I'll try to answer the ones I can. Um, other ones, I will try to get back to you within uh, the next couple of days. Um, I'll try to find an answer there as well. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. If you have any questions, please unmute yourself. Simon, that's pretty good. Um, you know, we do have standards in government, but sometimes um, uh, it also uh, relates to the, the private sector primarily and to the public sector as well. <clears throat> and, uh, but not everybody is covered. Now, <clears throat> the Department of Justice, of course, have their own set for government officials and predominantly for members of Congress, Department of Justice, and even the president. That's pretty good. And one of the things that uh, was not included on here was um, uh, improper sexual contact, uh, which when, when General Sims and I went through our glamour school, uh, that was one of the big things, especially uh, when uh, there's coercion involved or um, improper use of authority. Uh, sometimes dominates that stuff. And we've got, we've got people that we needed to clean that up. So uh, questions from the gallery? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Tony. Um, and and uh, a, a, Simon, a, just an excellent presentation. It is, yeah. Uh, it does bring back, um, you know, some of that comes back to me. Uh, but I also realized that some of it had, had uh, escaped off of my uh, uh, minuscule brain here. Uh, 
would it be possible to get a copy of this? Because uh, I still do a good deal of mentoring uh, of the uh, officers, both uh, junior all the way up through flag. Um, and a lot of what you had there has the detail and the references. And that's the thing that's probably most important because you get to a point where you can't answer that question, but then you have uh, the ability to refer that question with the appropriate uh, references. Uh, so if it's possible that I could get a copy, I would greatly appreciate it. A great sure. presentation, though, appreciate it. Yeah, uh, the slideshow yeah. is is on your, um, if you click on the uh, email you got from PPOM, the, the right. reminder, if you click on that, it, it the, the slides. Oh, the, the presentation, slideshow. I see, I yeah, see. Yeah, 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 I they're, do. They're available, yeah. yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Earl. You know, on the on the CFR on the uh, principles of ethical conduct that Simon mentioned, that was by executive order. There are fourteen principles, and the number one principle is that public service is public trust. Yep. Um, and that's pretty notable. It's broad, but if you serve in public service, military or federal agency, or in any case, is that if you're not if you're untrustworthy, then you're violating something. Uh, for that matter, large. And um, I know General Simpson and I uh, have friends that have been caught, um, especially when um, they do something. And of course, the A's that you talked about, Simon, the A's are there for, for a reason, not just to assist you, but to prevent you from doing the don'ts. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we, we went to our glamour school, uh, you know, where we're given a, a booklet of do's and don'ts. There were more don'ts in that booklet than there was do's. Um, and uh, a little bitty things and, you know, uh, the, the gallery talks amongst themselves that if, um, if they're doing something out of the ordinary, like dog sitting, dog walking and stuff like that, that'd be considered, that, that is considered as servitude. Um, and that's a no-no. Um, when you and generals or admirals or senior executives abuse their staff, that is called toxic leadership. And that could lead to an investigation and termination and the whole thing. But more importantly though, when people violate the standards of conduct, it not just affects the person um, that committed the misconduct, it also affects their families. Uh, but by nature of human interaction, it goes out into the Netherlands and next thing you know, uh, families are talking about other families and the kids talk about other kids to talk about other kids and then it goes viral from there. And that's the reason why we have this seminar today that it's not just that misconduct, but the appearance of or the perception of a misconduct can lead to termination or prosecution. And, um, and that recall, um, especially the one that committed misconduct, like um, being a sexual predator or um, child abuse uh, can get you recalled that we have done. And that particular general officer is, was a good friend of mine. And little did we know that he had been doing this for the last 23 years. And when uh, when the daughter finally turned him in. Yeah. So there's some, there's some brutal effects associated with public service. Uh, but then just because you retired and now you're a contractor or a consultant, um, if you commit anything out of the ordinary, of course, you can either be recalled or prosecuted, right? So it, um, it, it goes ways, but uh, other other questions from the gallery? Are y'all are y'all comfortable? I think I think it begs <laughs> begs the truth that uh, you're restricted, but but you're not really restricted as as long as you know how to how to properly conduct yourself. Any other Hi, questions? Duba, this is uh, Christine Enriquez. Oh, sorry, yeah. Lita. Okay. Go ahead, Christine. I do have a question. Hi, General Sims and teammates. How are you? <laughs> well, sir. Um, so Simon, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I've seen this, uh, I'm in a DOD interagency, 
And I've seen general counsel um, opine on different, uh, uh, different ways on this situation, but I was just interested in what you think. Um, it could relate to either a DOD civilian or um, a high ranking officer, but um, they could have an infraction or went through a general court martial and had been cleared or adjudicated. However, because they have been in the press or the workforce knows about this individual high ranking officer, when they come into a position of leadership, a, uh, the people that they will be leading um, may put a complaint uh, that they don't wanna work with that individual or they feel uncomfortable with that individual. However, I've seen different opines where you can't do double jeopardy. You have to uh, give that person a clean slate and um, you know they, they have to be, they can't, uh, you can't prove anything. They've already been adjudicated, but I've seen them either one, they've moved them from that position of, of authority or they have come into the agency or organization and then not given a fair shake because those that they are gonna lead uh, kind of know uh, what happened and don't really give them a chance. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on uh, how a leadership team can deal with something like that. Cause I've seen it happen both in civilian and military. Uh, yes, ma'am, that's an excellent question. And I wanna say that uh, before I kind of highlight certain things, uh, one, I don't wanna shoot from the hip on anything, uh, but um, I also am speaking on when I when my following answer is uh, strictly from Simon Chun, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, as an attorney um, and maybe as a lieutenant, but certainly not representative of the JAG Corps in any way. Um, so when there is an, when there is an edu adjudication and you talked about a court martial and someone is found not guilty, they are found not guilty. They're not found innocent. So that's something to keep in mind. It means that a court martial, a panel of members or a judge decided that we couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this person was guilty, but it doesn't mean that this person did not do it. So that's something to keep in mind when it comes to um, you know, treatment of individuals um, or any kind of rumors that may you know, fly and any kind of consequences that may exist. Now that may sound kind of prosecution friendly um, and I, I'm not personally, I'm, I'm actually more of a, um, a defense hack um, as, as some people would say. So if you have an ad set board or a court martial, um, I'm actually someone you wouldn't mind having on your defense team. Uh, but um, it's, you know, something to keep in mind is that. I think it, they're not found innocent, they're found not guilty. Uh, that said, you're right in that that person sh should absolutely have a tabula rasa when it comes to starting a new gig. Uh, that person is entitled to uh, you know, full treatment because none of their constitutional rights have been taken away as they have been judged at the, uh, you know, in, in before a court of law or an administrative court of some kind. Um, uh, you know, a good balance could be uh, that if someone does feel uncomfortable uh, working with or for a person like that, um, you know, but you know, saying that, okay, what we don't want to do is tarnish someone's reputation unfairly, but we also don't want to put you in a circumstance that jeopardizes your safety or well-being or your uncomfortable ways um, in any way. So that's when you might want to look into transferring that person into another department. Um, you know, some of the things that the Navy has, for example, when it comes to a sexual assault report, and not just the Navy, but the DOD wide are things like expedited transfers for someone who is a complaining witness or a victim them uh, in, in, in a circumstance, um, uh, while still making sure that the person who may be subject to a court martial is, um, you know, still being treated fairly and doing their duties on a day to day basis. So that's a tough balance. There is no easy answer. But I would say, that, you know, you kind of have to thread the needle um, in, 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 in that circumstance. Okay, so let me can I chime in here, sir? Uh, you know, I had a very similar right, when I was a battalion commander. One of my one of uh, lieutenants that was accused of something uh, in a combat zone, a full commander's inquiry, 15-6. and then of course they wanted to remove that individual, that officer from his current battalion, and, and gave it to me. Uh, we have to be very careful about uh, what we call now cancel culture, or, or, or putting in a stigma on that person, because it, it, it all t uh, it, for all the investigations that occurred, he was found not guilty, or there wasn't enough investigation. He didn't go to court martial. So I think as commanders and we're in leadership position, we have to be very cognizant of that so that we're not labeling this individual. And that individual officer was exceptional for me, became one of my top lieutenants and then uh, went on to, to do other things. But again, 
we have to be careful of labeling that individual because if, uh, like uh, the lieutenant said earlier, if he is found not guilty or not of evidence, whatever, uh, we can't find him guilty in our own eyes or within our own battalion because we've got to give him a, a clean slate. So that's another perspective that I encountered as a, a former battalion commander. Over. Thanks, Alan. That's that's very true. Uh, we had we have incidents in our own group, a uh, PPOM of an active duty officer who was falsely accused of misusing travel, uh, the joint ethic, joint travel regulations. Uh, but then coincidentally, she did, she was falsely accused and she was cleared of it. And we uh, restored to uh, her promotionable, promotionable, promotionable rank. But the whole idea that you're cleared, but that record uh, did not clear the Army Board of uh, Corrections uh, of Military Records. So that, that becomes sort of like a bad stain that you are cleared of any mis misconduct, but yet it takes forever to clear it from the military record, especially from the corrections and military records. And um, that's, that doesn't end the career per se, but it does affect post-retirement um, that you have to at least provide to the future employee that, well, of course, you know, losing your security clearance is a big deal. Yep. Even though you were found not guilty. But as long as that record is, 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 is inexistent and not expunged from any military record, that becomes a, a problem. And I think we have to deal with that. Any other questions from the gallery? Just one question, yeah. sir. Mike Yaguchi here. Um, Simon, did I hear you say under the gift rules that if an individual, um, and I don't think I heard you say it was rank specific, in other words, a higher standard for a general officer, flag officer versus uh, field grade or not, that the, the mm -hmm. gift rule, there's an exception if you present that individual a plaque if it's attributed to speaking engagement or meeting with a group um, that within reason, I'm going to assume you can't give a gold plated plaque to someone who shows up for five minutes and does a grip and grin. But did I hear you correctly that that $20 gift limit is doesn't apply? Uh, sir, yes, that is correct. So if, 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 if an individual, if say like a, um, and I don't think there is a field uh, or rank specific restriction on this, but let's suppose a colonel uh, was invited to speak at an event that they were uh, permitted to attend or something along those lines, and they received a plaque of appreciation uh, specifically uh, for that event. And Again, like you said, you know, it's within reason, um, you know, kind of like wood and a little metal or something like that. Um, that is typically uh, considered okay and falls within a gift exception. Okay. It, can an organization place a higher standard than what's um, been specified by the, by the federal ethics regulation? Yes, that's correct. So that there's a baseline and you can put anything above that. You just can't set anything below that. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Lynn has, Lynn has a question. I actually don't have a question, but I thank you, Simon, for um, for your presentation. I also want to sh do a shout out because I think I'm the only Navy-led household in this group. Um, so thank you. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> um, and as a retired uh, uh, contractor, defense contractor, and in charge, and uh, as the head of the legal department. Um, group of the legal department, particularly advising on our relationship with our DOD customers and, of course, our suppliers. Um, I want everyone here to know that uh, our, gift, our gift rules for our employees really mirrored every change that occurred in, our, in the DOD, um, including, you know, can the uh, DCMA person get a cup of coffee when they're out here auditing our, our uh, cost accounting requests. Um, and, uh, and I will also tell you that personally, my biggest issues that I had to address were, can, can we hire this guy? He's re really great. You know, he really helped us in our last, in our last, in, in our current contract. Like, no. 
Um, that was always a big surprise to everyone, although they all pretended it was a big surprise. But the other big, re really interesting phenomena was on WAGs, right? Right, the widely attended gatherings. Oh, yes, Lynn, you know, we really, we're gonna have all these people, it'll be really great. And then you start, you know, asking, well, who exactly is on this guest list? And then you really winnow it down to, uh, yeah. To the point where the law department had to be the bad people and say, no, you really can't do this. It's not a widely attended gathering. Don't even think about it. So I just wanted to let everyone here know that uh, yeah. um, the defense contractors really keep keep an eye on all this stuff. And and uh, you know, every Christmas, every every one of us would get a big you know basket of stuff from our various vendors, and we have it all out on our assistance desk, and everyone could share and stop by and pick up, uh, you know, some cheese or whatever, fruit or whatever. So, but thank you very much, Simon. Uh, and thanks to people um, for doing this. You know, nowadays when we invite even retirees that still have friends on the active side, when we invite a guest speaker, you know, from colonels or generals to all at the four stars, is that now we have to fill out either a 15 page to a 30 page questionnaire. Uh, and it has to go to their ethics lawyer uh, or their general counsel or the equal opportunity counsel, whatever have you. And what exactly is his role of participating? Uh, will there be fundraising? No. Uh, will there be a gifting? Possibly, you know, so uh, it's, it's become a norm since when I was still on active duty, Joe Sims would, would have tested that as well. But you fill out this application and be sure that it's truthful, of course, it has to be truthful. And what exactly is that general going to do in his 15 minute remarks or admiral, right? And then it'll, it'll take up to two months to get that approval. And that's why typically organizations do not invite an active duty general or an admiral. That's true. <laughs> invite a retired guy. He doesn't have to fill out that questionnaire. Uh, and then we can give him a gift, you know, besides a free meal or a, a, a free drink. But that's norm today. It's, uh, so th there's no appearance of conflict of interest. There's no appearance of gifting somebody with a job. So that's gifting or the, the, the notion that at the end of your tour in active duty that we will hire you on the board of directors. That's, that, that, you know, that, that becomes more of a dilemma than anything else. So, uh, so Simon, so, uh, how, are you gonna stay on, a, on active duty for 20 years or are you just going to be, you know, I'm just kidding, of course, but, uh, but our time is up. I've a great presentation, uh, Simon, and uh, it doesn't matter if you're, you're doing it for the Navy, but it, it also involves the, the entire Department of Defense and then some. And that should also apply to members of Congress. But of course, they don't have a code of, they don't have a code of conduct to begin with, but so I to say my opinion. Okay, listen, this is great. Uh, our next Seminar is on transition, military transition, not just military to civilian, but civilian to military. And that's September when? 18th. Yeah. September. That's a gauntlet, by the way. Website. Right. Retiring from the military to become a civilian is a gauntlet. You just don't retire and try to get a job. <laughs> There's a serious thing that you have to do. And my mentor used to say, <clears throat> For especially if you retired after 30 years, is that when was the last time you were a civilian again? And the second question is, what don't you want to do? Mm -hmm. Okay, two hard questions. And uh, I know we have a, a few members of our uh, PPOM membership that are in that scale. Uh, and uh, we're trying to help them through that. But again, thanks, Simon. Uh, Give our best to uh, your missus, uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, very soon. And good luck in your assignment as a flag aide to the um, to the TJAG of the Navy. Uh, you'll probably know that you won't have a life, okay? And um, 